Welcome to Middle Fingers Up, the show where we hold our heads high and our middle fingers higher. I'm your host, Kieran McKay. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with two remarkable individuals from the mental health field, Sajin Sandhu and Cassandra Omiso. With over 20 years together combined in mental health, both of them working with young people and their mental health, Sajin brings a wealth of insight to our conversation. And Cassandra, with her background in social work, also brings valuable perspectives to the table. But what makes this discussion particularly fascinating is that both Sajin and Cassandra have personal experiences of growing up in single-parent households. And that's really what we're getting into today. We're here to explore how their upbringings have shaped their relationships and daily lives. It's a conversation that delves into the profound impact of these formative years. So without further ado, I am going to welcome both. So thank you to the two of you for being here. Heck yeah, thank you for having us. We're super excited. I really like that you said we have over 20 years of experience together because it makes me sound like I started in this field when I was nine. (laughs) (laughs) That's why I said combined. (laughs) Combined. 20 20 years, it's really been that long. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're 20 years and I must be 40 years in, right? Yeah. (laughs) No, combined, combined together. You both have, what, over like 10 years each working in mental health, Yeah. right? We basically started at the same time, right? That's how we, that's how we met. You guys were co-workers that went into dating mode. Did you have to have a, like a meeting with HR? We started in our youth justice diploma at Douglas College, actually. Oh, I went to Douglas College too. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Shout out to Douglas College. Yeah. The, particularly <laughs> the New West that. Campus. Oh, no, we're the Coquitlam campus. Oh. Well, that's why we have a similar story, right? We both we both met at Douglas College. Yeah. Yeah, because Carrie and I met at Douglas College, too. Of, exactly. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I know. I that. Okay, so we already have for next podcast, we'll do yeah. Douglas College. <laughs> Douglas so College. Yeah, the in- union. interracial relationships at Douglas College. <laughs> they probably happen so often. Well, I mean, why not? Especially uh, the one in U.S., it's it's like they had this massive concourse, so you could literally sit out there and watch people coming in and going. So that's sort of where you get to, I guess, get firsthand of, ooh, I want to go talk to that person. Or Is that what you did, Karen? You know you what? You sat there yeah. in the concourse, and you're like, there's my man. I, I wasn't even enrolled in classes. I was just like some rando <laughs> sitting there taking notes all day, like the court lady that draws the pictures of the jury and the, you know, I'm just drawing pictures of my future potential husband. <laughs> Asking people's GPA. What's GPA? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm just doing some interviews for the people of Douglas College. Are you seeing anyone currently? Yeah. That is such a big- I really like it. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. We're already, we've already booked the second one, so that's already a good sign when we haven't even finished the first one. We're already booking the next one, so. Two minutes in. Yeah. But yeah, so we did a two-year youth justice diploma together, and the first year, we were like, we are friends. We didn't really hang out too much. I always say that he would sit beside me and always need to borrow a pen. Oh, good one, Sajin. <laughs> But he would always break my pen. He would break like the little cap part of it and then return it to me broken. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm literally doing that right now. Yeah. You're breaking it. Yeah. The anxiety. Yeah. I, yeah. I have to hold one too. And the cap usually falls off. I have like six caps on the ground always. It's just like the, your fidget toy, right? The the OG fidget toys. Yeah. He didn't need a fidget spinner. He just, we just needed the pen. Well, I, honestly, this is going to be great. I'm so glad you two agreed to come on. I, I've had this topic on on my mind for some time. I Like you, I've done some work in mental health, and we were sort of talking about this earlier. A lot of our demographics, so young people that would show up in crisis and trauma, uh, their, their major presenting concern was parent-child uh, conflict, and a lot of what came out of that was uh, parents were either separated or divorced, and there was major impact for these young people and their well-being. And everyone has a different story. However, when we started to do a little more research, and we did a little research brief at, at work where I used to work, 
there was a really interesting correlation that all the young people that came in that were diagnosed with anxiety had parents that were either no longer together or in the midst of uh, separation divorce. And so I just feel it's very few times in my life that I get to meet young people who say, oh yeah, you know, my, my, I come from a single parent at home and everything was hunky dory. Uh, there's lots of interesting things that come out of your childhood and you two are some of the most well-rounded young people that I've had the opportunity of being around, knowing, spoiler alert, we're related, we're family. <laughs> and so it's been really unique watching you two newlyweds and your relationship and you guys share some really rich, I think, history. So I'm looking forward to this conversation today with both of you. We'll see where, where, you, where you decide to take us. Do you guys want to just delve right into the Middle Fingers Up segment? Let's do it. Let's do yeah? It. Yeah? All yeah. right. Cassie, what'd you bring today? What do you want to put your middle fingers up to? Well, I was thinking about this morning and our kitchen is a mess right now. Oh. And I, yeah. And then I just thought, you only have two days off in a full-time job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how, how freaking annoying is it that you have to spend one of those days cleaning your house? So middle fingers up to whoever makes this house messy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we have to clean because it's not us. <laughs> yeah, it, totally. Is it the dogs? It must be the dogs. Yeah, it must when we're gone, they yeah, just yeah. cook food and <laughs> yeah, right. They're having their like poker shower. games and friends over. I agree. I think that's a good one because yeah, this whole, it's not even that. I wonder if it's even the five on two off schedule. Whoever came yeah. up with that one. So you only have so much time on the weekend and, and the weather's getting better. So do you really want to be in your house cleaning when you could be outside doing all exactly. the other things? Yeah. Well, exactly. Exactly. And uh, that kind of transitions next into my middle oh, finger. Oh, what do you what do you got, Saj? My vote being outside. I'm saying middle fingers up to trying to grow grass. In Alberta. In, in Leduc. Well, yeah, Alberta. Yeah. Yeah. But mainly Leduc, right? It's just so dry out here. It's just, I don't know. Yeah. So the last few years, we've been trying to get that nice lawn because, let's be honest, if you have the nicest lawn on the block, it's, you feel good, right? Yeah, obviously, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's that kind of thing. It just pisses me off, and then the amount of weeds. The grass isn't growing, but the weeds yeah, are, yeah. right? So I'm just stressed out by just <laughs> crushing a little corona and always just trying to maintain that weed like every night. So He used to make fun of me for this problem because I used to be out there all the time, like, we need to make this grass green. Like, no weeds in this bitch. Yeah. <laughs> but now he's starting to realize, like, oh, yeah, fuck these weeds. Yeah, no, yeah. Like, I like my lawn. I like, like, yeah. watering it every night. Totally. Like, find a peaceful time. Oh, right? yeah. so, but in Alberta, yeah. like, you go through this whole phase of getting your lawn to be green again. And then it's green in August. And then it's just yeah. boom winter. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I, I'm kind of, like, finding that. A lot of these houses, when we go for walks and you're like, look at these people's lawn, I'm learning that a lot of the elders were smart and they invested in fake grass, like the whole turf thing. So mm -hmm. I've been saying to Carrie, get some fake grass up in here because it's great right now, like you said, but in about a month, it'll be brown and gross and you can't really do anything with the dead grass. Maybe people, people judge out here too, so we're just like, yeah, oh, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. It is, <laughs> but think also environmentally, is that even the best thing that we have all these, like, we have these yards, and then we're using this water, water our. I mean, your middle finger is turning into a feel, different don't one for me. That, yo. Come on, that's just a place to vent, and you're supposed to make us feel good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on, you're like, wait a minute, it's this not is a great start. not a great start. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, maybe we should start all over again. <laughs> You're making my anxiety work. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. You're going to get some hate sodging now from the people who really love weeds because they save the bees. I'm Do sure. the weeds save the bees? I think, like, they're good for pollination. I'm going to that after, I don't know. Well, I, my middle fingers are going to go up to the Karens of the world. And this is, like, a touchy subject because I know my name kind of reflects Karen, but it's not. But, you know, I get called that sometimes. And there's a certain certain type of look of of a white older woman and she's always got the short gray hair and she's always in a rush she's got to be going somewhere and she might be driving she might be walking but wherever she is she does not like me ever it, it does not matter where i am i could be smiling karen's have taught me to smile more i'm like okay hey, maybe i have that face right like that that uninviting face but my sister and i were driving to the mall and i literally was laughing with my sister 
this woman was walking by. So I was smiling at her, letting her pass. And she turned around and gave me so much shit, like just yelling at me from outside. And my sister's like, oh my gosh, what happened? And I'm like, okay, this is exactly it. Can you ask her what happened? Because I get yelled at by Karens constantly and I don't know what I did. I don't know what I did. So if you are a white woman from the age of 45 to like 63, and you have short gray kind of hair and you're always in a hurry trying to <laughs> get places. Right. Can yeah. you please send yeah. me messages and let me know why, what I can do to be better because you guys hate me and I don't want to be hate by you. I feel like you're part no. of a cool club. <laughs> so please tell me what I'm doing when I'm doing it and how I can do it less. You ladies she just, freak she me out. just wants to be liked by the Karen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just want to be part Both of the girl. Yeah, I just want to be liked in general. So I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, I hate it. I get really nervous. I get yelled at all the time. All the And I always, after, Karen, sorry, ma'am. What's that? Yeah. Like you don't want to stoop down to their level, right? But then you start no. getting a little bit petty too. No. And you're like, why, why don't you like me? Why are you being rude to me? Yeah. yeah. My Surrey girl complex when my earrings come off and the window goes down and I, you know, but I, I'm trying to get past those years where I just start fighting, right? So I'm trying to, trying to invite some kind of niceness in my life and I don't know, it's not working, but okay, you two, like Sajan, I just want to start with you for a second. I just want to tell you, I... I had the opportunity of watching you grow up. Your mom was a single mom and your your like to me you are super remarkable, super resilient and you've always had this unwavering light that's always captivated me and I mentioned this a few episodes ago as well and you're the sergeant that I mentioned in episode 25 where I'm like I just can't ever be mean to you. You, you have this, and maybe your wife wants to roll her eyes. I don't know. She's like, why don't I get to see this size? But you have this light that never dims inside you. Like you're just always, okay, how can we see the best side of this? How can I use this as an opportunity? And I'm really grateful for having you here. And Cass, for you, I also am so privileged to feel like you and Sajin are together and I've had the opportunity of getting to know you. I've had I've been able to observe this this balance between the both of you and watching you both as you set your life and you know you're married or you got your own place you're growing grass now not weeds or doing all that stuff. And so I'm really excited to talk to you both about how you both have harnessed your childhood and your past and a lot of what we talk about here is going back and talking to our inner child, going back and maybe making amends with our younger self for the things that we didn't get or the things we see different now. So I'm I'm very eager to get into your personal backgrounds as well as how being in mental health has possibly served both of you in making sense of your childhood. So I'd love to ask both of you, and either of you can go first, what's one thing you both hope uh, to shed light on today? Coming from like that single parent household, I feel like there's two ways to think about it. And I think the way that you think about it can create your outcome. Yeah. And maybe sometimes you don't know that when you're young though, right? But yeah. now as I get older, like I realize, yeah, I had a single dad and it was just me and my sister at a micro level. But then you think about it in the bigger picture and it's like, well, actually, no, I had a whole community that raised mm-hmm. me. I had my aunts and uncles. My grandma was like a big support for us and If you think about it in that way, I feel like you feel connected. You don't feel, oh, my mom left me. So like poor me. Yeah. Which like it is shitty for sure. Right. But there was a whole bunch of other people that came together to help take care of me and my sister. Yeah. um, And fill that gap. Yeah. Right. Not, Not saying that there's still things in my life that affect me because my mom left. Right. But if you can change your perspective and I hope this conversation can help people think about it in a different light yeah. to try and focus on the more positives instead of the negatives. Cause when we, when we do on the negative stuff, that's when, and for me, at least that's when my mental health kind of goes down the drain yeah. or I need to yeah, work on myself a little more. So yeah, that's, yeah, re- that's really that's well that. said. I, I think sometimes it's hard when you're, whether it's your childhood or you're in a situation that's sort of consuming you to step back and look at it from a bird's eye view. And I think you say that really nicely. When we can step back and look at things from a bird's eye view, you see so much more perspective and 
a village is is a great way to describe your childhood that you you had support and love from different family members and community members and kudos to your dad for inviting that in too this this story that Sajin and I are sharing about each other's lives it's not the same for everybody else yeah like we were just blessed to have other people around yeah right mm-hmm. yeah no, exactly yeah that's what we find right like in the field too it's, it's even if there's that one healthy adult or there's that that connection that's warm that's safe that's loving that's caring yeah it, it really can impact you know the rest of your life and we definitely had a lot of that like I you know Kathy talks about it I talk about it too my family I'm going to Baba Jumanji's our grandparents you know like every weekend and having family events yeah kind of things are, are which like helps it shape me yeah. and basically uh, leave a negative impact from growing up in like a single family home and having some of the trauma that it, I did experience. Right. But sorry, I guess shedding the light was basically, it's pretty simple. Just take care of yourself and just do what you love. Mm. It really is important about doing what you love. Yeah. And, and really take care of yourself. Right. And I think you kind of saying that being repetitive or you really just tell your partner or whoever you're living with, Oh, you know what? I'm just going to do my own thing today. <laughs> I'm going to watch my own TV show. Yeah. I want to have a bowl of that. I want to do what I want to do. To have that relaxing night, then do it. Yeah. That's that's well said too. When we know ourselves or can know ourselves to the best that I guess we can, we're always growing, hopefully, and changing. But when you know what you need, I think there's been a few guests that have come on that have talked about identifying yeah, your triggers. Like what are the things that get you worked up, but also what are the things that really warm your heart and fuel your energy? And when you can see the difference between those and lean towards maybe fueling your energy in a good way, I, I think it's being responsible to ourselves. We we tend to want to take care of others, especially if you're in the field of mental health, I'm sure. You have to re- you two yeah. have to remind yourselves, whoa, check yourself. Like, what do you need to do right now for you? Definitely. Exactly. Yeah. So, Sajin, can you can you share some of the experiences growing up in a single parent household and how it has influenced your perspective on mental health? Yeah, definitely. So basically, I got my two sisters from junior me and my mom, Gurpreet. And then I also had my dad, Gurji, growing up there for the first, like, kind of early on years of my life. Around four years old, my mom and dad did work, and, and things obviously changed from there on. Yeah. That's kind of when I had to just growing up with my mom and my sisters. And there definitely was some challenges growing up with not having two parents yeah. or having like that male figure in your life. Right. So, so there was challenges on that end. And then as well as having a parent that's growing up in addiction, right? So I don't even you know, know to put what end of what my dad did. I know definitely drinks and, and cocaine and, and things like that, right? And yeah. just use some hard drugs. But I didn't know to what extent because I never grew up having a strong relationship with my dad. Right. Like, for example, I played soccer for like mm, seven years old to about 17, right? Yeah. And not one time did, I, did my dad come to one of my games. Yeah. So when I did see my dad, it was maybe once every couple of years. Right. When they first divorced, um, we would go through supervised visits with, with a social worker yeah. to make sure like something like that was all right. So it definitely impacted me. And I think going into the field of like youth justice and social services field, there was a lot of working on myself. Yeah. There was a lot of time to reflect and <laughs> and being in like some lectures, I'm like writing down notes or I'm having that light bulb effect of like, oh shit, like that's why. Yeah. That's why I do that, right? Right. And, yeah. And it's given me a different perspective. I don't think I would change much. I think I really appreciate my life as it is and what my mom did for me. But yeah, yeah. yeah there are challenges, definitely. For sure. So do you, do you care to, before we move to cast, do you care to share a couple of those light bulb moments for you? What are some things, if you can remember, that sort of stuck out for you that helped you shift your journey to, I guess, your journey of working on yourself or accepting some of the hard times or the challenges? Oh, for sure. Well, just in, in, in our kind of like Douglas College and the Youth Justice, we took classes on mental health. We took health classes on addiction, right? So on my early on years, I did drink quite heavily, right? And I was pretty reckless. So I think I think around that time, I got into a bad car accident and then my life took kind of a change. And that's when I was kind of sitting there reflecting on, you know, what path do I want to take? Do I want to keep living this lifestyle or do I want to try my best to not follow on my dad's footsteps. Right. Pretty much. Yeah. There, there was, there's many like, all, like moments, to be honest. Yeah. But even with family members, right? When we're talking about mental health, that class especially, which I had a lot of just moments like, oh, 
that's what that person is experiencing because mental health isn't really talked in our field going through as many diagnoses. So for me, I think, yeah, I just, I saw, I saw a lot of things and I kind of understood it in a, in a different light. Do you feel like going to school and mental health was almost like a blessing for you? It like, seems like it was really therapeutic for you. Yeah, no, I, I think so. I don't know if I'd be the person that was or once again could have gotten some sort of therapy for it, right? I wasn't going to counseling and I probably should have. But with going with going to school, yeah, I think it definitely impacted my level of the way I think now, what I'm doing now, yeah, the way I take care of myself. Because even now, right, like my anxiety can still be high. Yeah. Um, still get into ruts. So I have to, you know, every day take a look at what I'm doing and, and try to take care of myself or work on myself so I can be, be the best version of myself, really. Right. And anxiety mm-hmm. is one of those things that's just such a... On one hand, it's almost like this warning bell that goes off and is sort of helping us, those those people that experience it, maybe even for you, like, oh, I got to keep myself safe. I have to do something here. Something's not fitting right. But then on the other hand, it's one of those things like almost like gambling addiction where you you can't see it so well and you don't really know someone's having, you know, you, you know if someone's an alcoholic, but you don't really know if they're struggling with this thing over here. You can cover it up. Like I, I, I bet there's times that I've been in a room with you and you're probably trying to manage it or whatnot in whatever situation. And from the outside, it looks like you're totally fine. And so I, I, sure. I always think it's one of those things that is so hard to label or describe and everyone experiences it different or maybe even like identify that we're having that problem. I wanted to say like anxiety is such a blessing and a curse. Yeah. It it protects you. It there's an example. I was in a conference over the week in Calgary and there is an example a woman gave of being late for work and what got you to be there on time, right? Well, I know I need to be there. I need to get up. I need to get ready. I don't have the chance to go get a coffee at Starbucks because I'm already late. Yeah. Like that anxiety made sure that you got to work a little, you're a little bit late, but you're not, oh, I'm just going to stay in bed. Yeah. And then when I feel like it, I'm going to go grab coffee. Yeah. And then I'll go to work whenever I want, like hours later. Right. Yeah. Like that's a, that's healthy anxiety. That's getting you motivated and getting you where you need to go to function in life. Yeah. And then there's the opposite, right? Where you're struggling with your body internally what's going on for me. I can't even figure out why I'm anxious. Yeah. And sitting in that unknown is really, can be really difficult. Totally. That's very well described. Absolutely. What, what about for you, Cass, can you, can you tell us about your own journey? I'm and I'm going to come back to you for a second. Could, can you tell us about your own journey of being raised in a single parent home? You talked about being raised by your father earlier and how (laughs) it's shaped your understanding of mental health. Yeah, for sure. And that's so complex. Like, I don't even really know where to begin. But I was raised by my dad, Greg Silva. Shout out to him. And my little sister was with us, Ashley. And yeah, my mom, a little bit different than Sajin's story, my mom was in and out of addiction. So there was parts of my life where she'd come back, things would be okay, she'd be clean. And then there'd start to be signs that she's using again. Then she disappeared to like the downtown east side. But my dad, very much like me, is a very uh, empathetic person. He wants the best for people. So he would keep bringing her back into the house. Yeah. And I think that's where my anxiety has started from was like, even though he was trying to do the best juggling, oh, I want the kids to have a relationship with their mom. She's going to do better this time. That was also a struggle for me because... That was me keeping tabs on, oh, is my mom okay or no? Yeah. Yeah. And is this going to affect my family or no? Yeah. I think that even now as adult, I can see that. I can see that part in me like, oh, is Sajin upset today or no? Right. (laughs) And he sees that too. Like he knows. Yeah. And I've been working through that a lot. And I think it's definitely gotten better. So like every day that's still a struggle. Yeah. I know why. I know why and where it came from. So yeah, in and out of my life. And then Sajin actually got to see a part of that family dynamic because my mom was healthy when we first started dating. Yeah. And she was living in the house. But then got to see the decline of that and family dynamics there and how I'm usually the one that notices it first. Mm -hmm. I have to say something to my dad and then it's okay. She has to leave now. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. 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 
So I'm very much the older sister dynamic, very much like protector of the siblings and yeah, probably sometimes in the, the relationship too. Protector role that, that you go to play for, for your sister and maybe even your dad and, and your brother. And then you're saying you sometimes walk into a room and th- there's this level of vigilance because it's a survival instinct. You, you probably yeah. had to walk into a room and figure out what kind of Cassie has to show up in this room carefree, the reserve, the alert, or, or whatever it may be, right? And so it, it makes sense that even though with your husband, that's not the quite the extreme of what's happening, but something that he's throwing out there is getting you to go back to that place of, hold mm-hmm. on a second, what, what kind of instinct am I supposed to walk in here with? Did you want to add anything yeah, to what you were like saying? Even, oh, I was just saying, I've been doing a lot of therapy. Well, I started therapy in like after my mom left probably like 2015 I started therapy and it's been really helpful for me to realize that part of my life when I needed to determine people's emotions and behavior to determine my safety that that isn't always necessary anymore and taking the steps to acknowledge that has been helpful because now Sajin and I sometimes I will be like okay Is something going on or is this just me? Can you talk a little bit more about that, Cassie? Because I think that that can be really valuable for many of us listening in in how I I appreciate that you're talking about going to therapy. And how did you get to that place where you can recognize in present time isn't necessarily whatever it is that happened in the past? This is a different situation. How do you how do you disconnect those two things? Well, the first question about like starting therapy was actually because I was experiencing burnout and I didn't know. Mm. Combination of like being an adult and then my mom leaving was like some kind of shock to my system because I knew my old coping skills were not the same as now. Like when I was little, it was not the same as an adult. Yeah. But then also I was in school, a practicum, and I was working two jobs. Yeah. And when you're new in the social work field, you don't know how to say no. If someone needs you to pick up a shift, you're going to do it. Mm-hmm. If you need to stay longer at your practicum, you do it. And it's because you care about the kids. Yeah. And you don't know your threshold yet in the field. So yeah. I very quickly figured out my threshold. Uh, working in a group home, I actually had to call the ambulance to take a kid to the hospital because she was or they were complaining of chest pains. And, you know, you have to take that seriously no matter what. Right. And so in that moment, that person was like, you have to be the one to go on the ambulance with me. You have to go on the ambulance. I was like, okay, like, <laughs> I got you. We'll go to, on the ambulance together. Yeah. And in that ambulance, I, I like experienced my first panic attack. Oh. And I've never felt like that before. And you're stuck in this little box. Yeah. And you can't be outside. And you're trying to be that support person for the person that was in the group home, that youth. So you have to remain strong while also being like, what the fuck is going on with my body right now? I feel like I'm going to pass out. Yeah. You're like, uh, um, can I lay on this stretcher with yeah. you here? Can you move over? <laughs> I think can my I chest pains are a little uh, stronger than yours, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of your Take elders, care kid. <laughs> Take care of me first, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, so that happened. I actually went home. Sajin was living with his friend. I went back to his house and like, I felt better. And I kind of moved on from that. Right. But then there was just this, it started to like spiral where I like couldn't eat. I didn't know what was going on with my body. I was like feeling really anxious for no reason. And then at one point I I went to the hospital because I was like, I'm either really sick or something is wrong with me. Yeah. And Sajin went with me and I ended up seeing a psychiatrist. And I was sitting in that room and I've never felt that low before. Like I actually felt and I don't know, this not this is not the proper terms at all. But I looked up at Sajin and I was like, am I going crazy? Because mm. I like thought something was super wrong with me. Like mm-hmm. I was having like some kind of psychotic break. Mm-hmm. So I saw the psychiatrist. He ended up thinking I had panic disorder. Hmm. Which, okay, valid, like all the symptoms and stuff that I was going through. It, it could resemble that. I knew that wasn't, that's not what I had. Yeah. I tried to recommend medication and I am all for that. If you feel like you need it, Mm -hmm. you need to, yeah, do what you need to do. But for me, I felt like therapy was the right route for me. Yeah. So I found a a therapist who was amazing and she did a lot of CBT. Okay. So that's cognitive behavioral therapy? Yeah. Cognitive behavioral therapy. 
and to work through panic and anxiety. It's a really great way to get your thoughts and feelings Mm kind of on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of that has really helped me grow. Yeah. And then now I see a therapist and we work on EMDR, Mm -hmm. eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy and EMDR. Yeah. Um, it's really been a great thing for my nervous system Yeah, that's, to deal yeah. with those moments when I think Sajin is here and I need to figure out what kind of day he had. Yeah. Well, and I think and then to sit back and be like, oh, actually, I think this is a me problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sajin's like, yes, <laughs> yeah. you said it, not me. I really like how you're talking about seeing someone and sorting through some of this stuff, because I think sometimes we think we grow up and we get distracted by work and jobs and relationships and some good things too, like vacations that we think, oh, I turned out fine. I'm okay. And then there's moments in life where we we get caught up with our past. And for you, it might have been on that ambulance maybe before. And I and I think sometimes we have these big, big feelings and we don't know where it's coming from. And we don't realize as humans, we're not as complicated as we think we are. We store a lot of that pain and those life experiences. If if we don't make sense of them up in our head, we store them somewhere in our body. And yet we still have a hard time understanding that. And it shows up. So like this pain that you might have experienced as a child is now showing up in this really weird moment and it it's not fitting. And I think it, doing EMDR or CBT or, or whatever form of therapy, I think can be really hard to take that and look at it from a different perspective of, oh yeah, okay. And you're entitled to those big feelings. I think we push them away because I'm, like you said, quote unquote, I must be crazy. Like I, I shouldn't be feeling this or I'm fine. I, I'm going to school now. I'm about to work in mental health. I got this together, whatever our narrative is. But that childhood narrative doesn't change. Sajan, I was going to ask you, as well as a mental health professional, look at you two, both of you in, in the house, your dogs must love you. How do you think your upbringing has influenced your empathy and ability, not just maybe work with your wife, but also with young people that you work with that may be struggling with their mental health? Like nowadays in the field too, it's just looking out and knowing that everybody has a story, right? So my story, I guess you could say, once again, growing up in a single family home, the next person, and especially working in the field, when I hear their stories, yeah. a lot of them are heartbreaking, right? So yeah. I think I always carry empathy with me, and, and I use it in places too. You try to say, like, oh, we saw it, and he's, he's always smiling, so nice, yada, yada, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Because I'm trying to take a, a perspective on, even when somebody's mean, I try to look at what, it, what do they go through, and it makes me feel bad. Oh, they're, they're mean, or they're acting this way because of these reasons. Yeah. They're in their self and smoke right they're they're feeling attacked so for me as a empathic person i'm always looking at that i know everybody comes from a certain lifestyle everybody comes from a struggle and they've gone through something so i, I kind of want to understand their story first before judging and i think that's where i've gotten my success in my field is knowing that everybody has this a story it's individualistic yeah. which is trying to learn that story seeing where they come from and then trying to be that motivation for them right maybe there's some some of the things that i didn't have and, and that's why I entered the field. I did have healthy role models, but I still feel like I was I was lacking some things. Yeah. Like I, I still didn't have that father figure. Yeah. I still definitely feel impacted by, by my upbringing, right? So yeah. Do when you- I'm in the field now, I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to do almost sometimes like or take his approach of doing the things that I, I feel like I wanted or that I needed in this sense or, mm. yeah, that kind of gives me a different perspective. So you're saying you're giving back to the young people maybe the the type of empathy that you didn't get at times or were looking for and didn't receive is that what you're saying you're trying to yeah exactly trying to be trying to be aware of that trying to be aware that a lot of these kids a lot of them identify of not having anybody to go to some of their parents are like their friends some of their, they don't have any parents yeah. and, and they're trying to find somebody I, it's a blessing for me that i had aunts uncles cousins like my cousin cam who was a huge influence for me um, as a male role model Many people, right? And, and it's sad to see once again in the field. And, and nowadays, there are, there are youth and there's kids struggling out there that yeah. really feel real. Yeah. And that's what stands out for them to feel like they have any love. And, and they're seeking that attachment issues as well, attachment problems. Oh, I bet for sure. What would you both say about attachment? And we, there's a lot 
There's a lot of talk nowadays about attachment, healthy attachment, insecure attachment, not secure, all that. So go in by your own life experiences and where you are now as adults. How do you define what is healthy attachment? Bajan, you can say yes or no, but I, I think we're so lucky because we haven't always learned the best attachment when we were younger, but because we went into this field and we got the education that we did, we have the skills to work through when issues arise because of our mm. like attachment. Yeah, that's probably where we find some of our success too, right? Like yeah. having that patient that comes stressed out, like taking that time, like the cat, I, I need this day to myself and she's very understanding or if she needs to do something for herself, I try to be very understanding in that sense and, yeah. and realizing where it's coming from. Like this is us taking yeah. care of ourselves and, and protecting ourselves and this is what we need. Right. So respecting I think from each other, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. I, would, yeah. I would agree for that for sure. Yeah, I, I, I join you too. Like I sometimes sit here and think, especially as a mom, like how lucky am I that I pick the field that I pick to study in and stay in and, and get to learn so much from coworkers and staff and young people and families because I get to bring that wealth of knowledge to my day-to-day parenting. But I also wonder though, like you also mentioned, Cassie, there's this empathetic role that you talked about playing too. And where, where does it serve you? And then when does it work against you? Because you also talked about your mom coming back a few times with your dad and watching that as well. And so, you know, you also talked about your threshold. So are there times with empathy where you think there there's a line where I can only understand this person's situation so much? Or do you both feel that, that there's no line there? Empathy is empathy, no matter what. I definitely think there is a line to empathy, especially... In the current field we're in, we don't know a lot of the struggles that some of our students, our coworkers have been through. I think we can be empathetic and try and have an understanding of everybody's stories, but I don't think we can necessarily say we put ourselves fully into someone's shoes because we can't. Yeah. Like, there's no way oh, to yeah, do that. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 Do, you, do you guys feel that your knowledge of mental health sometimes gets in the way of what uh, a normal couple fight should be or would be oh, oh yeah i think it definitely shapes that like even our arguments right like yeah. if we're in an argument i think i feel bad too because i look back where, where kathy came, came from and i can i can once again like understand or somewhat empathize what she's going through yeah. so in our arguments i think that's that's definitely what, what's helped us is having that yeah have a look. i have a question for you cass I want to go back to like single parent households and your background. So Cass, your background is also social work. So you both did the youth justice diploma, but you also have a background in social work, right? Yeah, I did two years of youth justice and then did a bridging year and then finished my degree in social work. Okay, so I just have like a social work question. And Sajin, maybe your experience will answer this too. But for you, Cass, with your social work background, how would you say your personal experiences have informed your understanding of the intersection between social factors and mental health in individuals that come from a single parented household? Totally. And I think that is such, it's so complex. A lot of the people that I've worked with, yeah, there's a lot of single parents and single family households, but also there's like so many other factors that intertwine with that. You know, especially working in an Indigenous community, we we see a rise of a lot of other factors for these kids. So right. it's hard to say what specifically comes from a single parent yeah. household. And I just, I hear and read that there's so many stats working against young people that come from a single parented household. So when you, when you do your research and you read these articles and there's so much talk about how you two technically are a stat and yet you're not because you guys have worked, you know, the opposite direction of that sitting here, being able to understand your struggles and, and not everything was a struggle. I, you, you both have talked very, very highly of both your father and your mother and, and the roles that they played in the home and they did the best they could. And, and on the show, we talk a lot about that in the sense of, I always talk about children of immigrant parents, like our parents are the best they could. I'm doing the best I can as a mom. And 10 years from now, I'm going to look back and think, fuck, I could have done that so much better, right? Hindsight's a bitch. So yeah. I, I understand that. And I'm definitely not 
talking about that. But when you read a lot out there, there's so much working against young people that grow up in a home where they have one parent taking care of them. And yet you two have a very different story. You've both lived with addictions. You didn't really know your dad, Sajin, the way that you talked about, Cass, your mom came and went. And I'm sure that impacts how you talk about attachment. And yet you're both sitting here, chose mental health and doing the work you do and bring a lot of your learnings from your childhood into your relationship and support each other. So I'm just sitting here wondering how come you two weren't part of that stat? Like what things in the best way possible got in the way of you two not being in this place where you're not in this healthy relationship? I think it's the single parent is like a factor, but then the the other things behind that can impact the outcomes of a single parent household. Maybe the single parent has a really low income job versus a single parent who has a high paying job that can change your outcomes of life. Or if the single parent is like a first generation immigrant, right? That could change your outcomes too. My mom is indigenous. So I always think of the intergenerational impacts that my mom had to face and what she had growing up. Yeah. And how that was a result for her versus her other siblings. Right. And I, th- I think when we're looking at the stats and, and what we see, you know, an increase, whether it's anxiety or somebody creating like a criminal act or, you know, ending up in jail, there is more challenges when you're growing up in a single family household. Yeah. Right? I think that, that's the reality of it mm-hmm. is, is there is more challenges. There's a higher chance of not having enough, m- enough money for food. You're not getting the right nutrition growing up. There's yeah. there's chances of you being unsupervised. And that was my case. Is, yeah. is when I was a teenager, I had a lot of freedom. My mom working in corrections. Yeah. I could walk out the front door, you know, at 2 a.m. Or I could invite people over yeah. whenever I wanted to. So not having that parent that was actually watching you was, was another factor. So yeah. Yeah. it doesn't mean that you can't, you know, come out of this mm-hmm. in a successful way. And I would still, once again, I would say on this podcast too, I'm still working on myself and yeah. I don't think I'm at my, my mm-hmm. best self. So yeah. when I'm talking here, I'm still in my journey of, of figuring out my anxiety and figuring out who I am and yeah. and working on, I would say, like the negative qualities of myself. Yeah. So, yeah. But the, the, the reality, and I guess when you, once again, when you're looking at the staff is I, I found a lot more challenges growing up in a single family home for sure. Yeah. You think about it growing up. Yeah, we both had single parents. But how many ta- how many hours in a day are we actually home? You go to school for six, seven hours. Mm-hmm. You come home. On the weekends, you, I don't know, maybe you're with your cousins or something. Mm-hmm. Right. So although there's a single parent, there's all these other people, like your teachers and stuff like that, that raise you. A big portion of your childhood is being raised by other people as well. Yeah. And... That that also can change your outcome of all the stats that you find on single parent households. Well, when you go down that avenue, once again, it's like, yeah, it's like bringing it back to like, if you have one person that really cares or is showing mm-hmm. love, right? It could be a school counselor, it could be a child needs care worker, it could yeah. be a group home worker. Yeah. That child needs to know that they're safe, that they're loved, yeah. and that they're, that they have awesome qualities, mm-hmm. right? And, yeah. and trying to like, and that's what I do with counseling is, is really trying to set goals and make that individual realize that they they do have a mastery skill. They are excellent at something and that like, you know, they, they, they can do yeah. what they want, right? Like mm-hmm. they, they, they do have that in themselves, but with a negative mental health, obviously there's a lot more work to it yeah. Yeah, than, yeah. than working on goals. You know, that's where the focus is, is, is trying to be that, that person and that support. Yeah. Like Kathy said, I think that's where we find some of our successes that we had some healthy people in our life and we had great role models. We had um, some great parents in our life, mm-hmm. right? That that gave us those skills and those qualities. You know, there there is a great side to this world. Yeah. If both of your your Sajin, your mom and Cass, your dad, if they were sitting here today with us, what what would you both want to tell them? What is something oh that God. you'd love to You're tell them? Trying, just trying to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> It does, I'm not going to cry, but it just hurt my, it pulled Aww, my heart. It's, and it's okay. I think that means you have a lot of love for your dad. Uh, exactly. That's a good question though, yeah. for sure. Are you talking about, sorry, my dad, what I was no, saying? like, well, I'm going to start mom. with your mom. What, what is something you, you want your mom to know and remember about her raising you and playing this major role in your life? So my mom is a huge, huge 
influence and impact into who I am, right? I'd write little stories when you're in elementary school and saying, like, who's your hero? It'd be my mom. Um, I think she was an amazing woman. And we try to look at back on, on what they came through, her yeah. coming from India, coming from a different country, yeah. going through the challenges that she went through, really trying to, yeah, understanding what they went through. So not trying to, you know, pick out like the, the negative qualities or the crappy things that they might have done or the mistakes that might have happened, right? Yeah. I think deep down, my mom did everything she could for me and my sisters. I'll give you guys an example. A list right here today. We, we had this one day we call Wacky Wednesdays. It's where my <laughs> sisters had baseball. Sisters had baseball, maybe even soccer. I also had soccer and other sports. And my mom would literally just be driving us around, um, dropping us all off at different sports and like picking us up and then trying to get to the next one. Oh. Before Google Maps was a thing, trying to find these ads. <laughs> yeah. To break down, right? All that stuff. Us crying in the back of the car. <laughs> Yeah, uh, wacky Wednesdays, a little wacky, and that's that's a little glimpse into like a single family home. Is you got McDonald's though? Yeah, I got a lot of that. <laughs> that yeah, that's that's little- a really cute example of wacky Wednesday. Yeah, she's just trying to end to have her kids in sports. So that that's a very difficult. That's also in the articles and research we see young children that grow up with a single parent, especially if like you talked about Cass of poverty or, you know, being part of the low economic status, if that plays a part, being in sports, let alone being a child of an immigrant parent, likely isn't going to happen. And you're here saying, well, you know, it was this, this is Wacky Wednesday. We're driving around trying to get all three of us to our sports and k- kudos to her for making that effort and doing that because yeah as kids we don't we don't know the lengths our parents go to to do the things they do right and that's not really for us all to know anyway that's and as kids that's what we saw right we got to see her doing those awesome things we didn't get to see her suffer all this all the crappy things that she suffered during our relationship i want to add that too is like she went through a lot of shit yeah and she tried she tried really hard and you know what i mean and really hard not to show you what was going on behind the scenes? I try to put myself in those shoes all the time. Like imagine me being Babaji coming from India or going to a different country and, yeah. and speaking a new language and getting a new job. But for me, I'm like, holy crap, man. These guys are amazing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I, I look at the strengths of, of the previous generations. And I'm like, holy smokes. Yeah. You guys had to do a bit different. And I think now we're in a different struggle. So I don't want to undermine the youth and, and what they're going through. I think it's just a different kind of struggle and a totally. different challenge. What we're experiencing now. Yeah. Well, and you, yeah. you continue to talk like you both started about that, like Cassie had mentioned, that bird's eye perspective of sometimes mm-hmm. when times are tough for, for us or as you're saying for yourself as an individual, and here's another example of how look at the work your mom and her parents had to go through to get you to where you are as opposed to, yeah, my life sucks. My life was hard. And absolutely there's times where we have a right to say that my life sucks, my life's hard because that's a reality. And when we can see these little tiny sparkling moments of, wait a minute, I, I have the strength of my mom. I, I think that can, that can help us in, in those dire situations or when we think the world's caving in, right? I think if you haven't told your mom that, I think that'd be really cool for you to share that with her and, and let her know that. And what she, if, you know, she's listening to the podcast. <laughs> yeah, there you go. She'll, she'll know now. You can tell her. Mom, listen to this one. one. Uh, What about for you, Cass? What would you say to your dad if he was here today? I think as I get older, I like start to really be grateful for everything he did. He had to raise two girls. (laughs) Like that's hard. Yeah. (laughs) And I remember, I remember times, because like in elementary school, I thought I was a cool kid. And like, (laughs) I would beg him for clothes that were just like ridiculously expensive. And like, he would have to say no, because obviously we don't have a lot of money and he was trying to save up for a house and stuff like that. And just like the, the attitude I would give him, like, I am so sorry. <laughs> that yeah. was awful. Yeah. So like putting up with that stuff and, you know, little girl, girl fights that me and my sister would have <laughs> dealing with that. And for me too, like he, he made sure if I wanted to be in a sport, he would make that happen. And right figure out ways to get me to where I needed to go. He worked six days a week for a really long time. Shout out to my grandma and my aunt also for taking me on weekends to do fun things like go to the Cloverdale farm flea market. I just wanted to share too with my dad. Yes. Yes. He deserves a big shout out. And when my dad found out my mom was pregnant with me, 
he stopped drinking and I have never seen him drink an ounce of alcohol in my whole life. Oh. He had a big drinking problem. Yeah. And as soon as he found out my mom was pregnant, he quit cold turkey yeah. and just never again. Never, ever again. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever talk to him about what happened there? Like how he came to that place? Because that's a, that's a big decision. Well, I, I heard like stories of my grandma being like, listen up, you got to get your shit together. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have like a kid coming mm-hmm. and I will never talk to you again if you mess this up. He he knew that's the kind of guy he is. Yeah. He's caring and he knows when like push comes to shove, he has to do what he needs to do to yeah. take care of a small human. So yeah. Yeah. That's shout out to him. Impressive. Yeah. Shout out for sure. You think that he knew that somewhere in there that he was going to be this primary caregiver and he needed to step it up in a different way? Oh, probably. Yeah. My mom has been like in and out of addiction since she was like a very young teenager. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there was like signs of that. Yeah. Before she was pregnant with me. Right. So can can I ask you both, you both shared what you would say to your primary caregivers. May I ask, I'm not sure if I'm overstepping, so you don't have to if you feel like it's not possible. May I ask what would you say to Saj and your dad or Cass, your mom, if they were, if they were sitting here today? Where are you? Where, where, where are you? Where were you? You guys are hilarious. I'm like, should I laugh too? I don't know. Hee hee. I don't know. <laughs> we always, we make really inappropriate jokes sometimes because you just have to. Like, he'll make your mom jokes or I'll like make your dad jokes. <laughs> There's an Austin Powers song. Yeah, da- Daddy goes, wasn't there. Daddy yeah, wasn't there. To change my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess you got to make sense of it somehow. The fact that you guys can make a joke out of it. Yeah, what, 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 have you had that conversation in your head? Like what you would say if at some point, maybe for a minute or not, but if, if they were truly sitting here or, or have you had that conversation in your head with what? if you had an opportunity or have you ever written a letter to them about what you would want to say to them? Well, I, I still am in contact with my mom, like on and off. She lives on the downtown East side. So it's really spotty when I get that opportunity. Are you talking um, about in Vancouver? So I, yeah, in yeah. Vancouver. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For all the people that don't know. Yeah. So East, East. East, like East Hastings sort East of Hastings. area. So long story short, she uh, ended up in the ICU uh, last year. And the doctor called me, basically told me, you know, you need to come say goodbye because we don't think she's going to make it out. She has COVID, she has pneumonia and like all these infections just from substance misuse. So I was like, okay. So I went there, like planning to, you know, go see her, do what I need to do to make myself okay. And then come back to Alberta. But she ended up waking up and it wasn't COVID pneumonia. So she was really lucky. It was just regular pneumonia. And I, I don't know, she's like a superhuman that pers- she's probably almost died lots of times. <laughs> wow. And they said they kept giving her like enough medication to kill a horse. And she just, it helped her get healthy. And she, she told me she wanted to go into treatment and stuff like that. So Luckily, I do have my social work background and I was able to advocate and know my resources in the Vancouver downtown east side. And, you know, housing is really hard for people down there and housing in general in Vancouver is such a crisis and a problem and trying to find treatments. And she had a really great team around her and me and the team got her to a place where she had treatment and have a safe place to live. Yeah. But it wasn't the right time. I think she really wanted to put on a front that she was ready for me and my sister. Yeah. And kudos to my sister for doing a lot of the groundwork with her because I was in Alberta. Yeah. I left after a bit. She wasn't ready. And I think that that realization for me was like, okay, you have all the knowledge to know and have empathy for her and where she's at now. But for me, I needed to be put a boundary in place because I didn't want to consume myself with that role anymore. Yeah. Call me a couple of weeks ago and oh, wow. said the same story that she wanted to get help again. And this time I said, you know, there's a social worker right beside you and she probably knows way more resources than I do. And I hope you get the help you need. And if your social worker has questions, she can definitely contact me. But 
Like she needs to be the one to help you. Yeah. This time. Yeah. How yeah. was that for you to have that kind of a conversation? I, th- I think it felt really good. Yeah. For me, I, I've gone on this roller coaster of like as a kid being really mad at her and then having an understanding because of my education, yeah. um, giving it a try to help her from a different per- like version of Kathy, like yeah. a different version of me. Yeah. And then, you know, like giving her that opportunity and then now being like, okay, on, honestly, my mom knows more resources than I do on the downtown east side too. Like she, she used to be a manager of housing down there. Right. And I know that she, she cares for a lot of the women down there, especially women and children. Like she's a big advocate as much as she is in her addiction. So yeah. like, I know her losing is not safe, but I also know that she loves the community that she's in to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. And like, how much can I change that? Right you feel a sense of relief. How how did you get there? I, I, that's not the answer that I was expecting to hear from you. So that's like a bit of a surprise. How did you get to that relief feeling? Therapy, like a lot of therapy, (laughs) but, um, yeah, just a lot of self-work and empathizing with my mom, but also being empathetic to my experience with her and that journey and just knowing that like, okay, she went through this growing up. This is a well, why this is why she is the way she is yeah and that's okay that's her experience but this is my experience because of her experience right and I need to navigate that for myself yeah thank you for sharing that mm. what about for you Saj if if do you want to answer that if your dad was here what would you say yeah like we were just having a conversation because we were going on this podcast right so we already had some kind of chat about what we would say and I really wanted, like, I would always love it if my dad reached out. Like, I would go on the visits or I'd go out to dinner um, if there was an opportunity where my yeah. sisters would be a bit, a bit more, like, hesitant and be like, no, we don't want to see him. Yeah. He's a jerk. And I'd be more, I'm thinking, outlook that he's trying. And, and now, here at 30, I would say, I almost, I don't know if he says, like, a step back or what it is, but I, I no longer really... Like allow him to reach out, or I don't. I don't engage. Like I haven't talked to him in a couple of years, maybe a few years. Like I can't. I can't even recall. Right, really. So I'm kind of in a stage now where I look at it with, yeah, I don't. I don't have a connection with him. And, and the last time I saw him, I saw him at an Indian restaurant on my birthday, and I didn't. I didn't say anything to him. Actually, we were back to back, and and Cass tapped me on the shoulder. She, I think that's your dad. And and I saw him, and I like got really, really like nervous and anxious. My heart started racing and yeah. I, I took a chair. I decided not to, to like say anything to him. So I guess I'm still stuck there of, of not mm-hmm. knowing what to say, yeah. right? Like I, I've said, I guess in the beginning and I, I hope for change. Right. And now I'm 30 and he's getting closer to 60. And yeah, and I think what I struggle with too is with my anxiety and where I'm at. There is some sort of blame there too. So yeah. Cassie has definitely worked through it. And I think the therapy piece is great. Yeah. I'm definitely like, I've gone to therapy and I've, I've tried it, but mm-hmm. the downside to me is I, I'll do therapy for a couple of sessions and then I just won't go again. Yeah. Yeah. So hoping that breakthrough is going to happen. I'll, I'll take a step back and be like, no, thank you. Yeah. So yeah. I guess I'm still on the journey of figuring it out. I don't know what I would say to him. I, I think I, I would think he's being empathized with empathy so much. I'm trying not to say it anymore, but yeah. I'm going to go and say it again kind of empathize where he came from right mm-hmm, like I yeah. heard a lot of stories of my grandpa being pretty harsh and pretty strict and I know he grew up in a in a household with a lot of probably abuse yeah. as well yeah. and I don't really know his story yeah from that and I don't have blame from him I wish him the best and I just wish he could get sober right I wish almost the best for him but I through the years I'm also a bit discouraged yeah that he would he would not help right so yeah I I'm think that's that. that's fair it, yeah. Maybe for you, it's it's less about what would you say to him and more about what do you hope he would come say to you? Like, it sounds like there's that unfinished business. Stuck in that stage of like, yeah. you know, partying and glorifying drinking and, and joking, joking around about using cocaine and yeah. heroin. And it's just like, uh, you're kind of like, I'm standing there like, damn, it's unfortunate yeah. that he didn't have realization or had that change. Um, but I don't know where he's at right now. Like, yeah. you know, things could be different for him, but I also don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, sometimes it's it's difficult seeing your parents and thinking, you know, that whole arrested development 
piece where you, you surpassed your maturity has surpassed and your your parent is still behaving as if they're in their adolescence or 20s or or whatnot and it's it's hard because they're supposed to be your parent and exactly. and yeah. your you you guys a lot of the undertones of what you're saying is you grew up parenting your 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 parent uh, whether it was your father or your mother and so there's that piece of your childhood too that had you had to grow up fast in many ways what well, and it doesn't matter if you're the oldest or the youngest you, for you, mm-hmm. Sajan, you're probably looking to your older sisters and sort of following their lead and they had to grow up, which means you had to grow up as well. And it, it's very clear yeah. for you, Cass, that that's, that was your role. That was the, the role that you played in the home. And I think mm-hmm. sometimes when we, when we have those roles, they can serve us as well as we get older. So do you guys ever look at that side of you, that caretaker? Do you feel those roles come into your, both your relationship? I, I actually was just going to say that, like, yeah, I, I usually am the caretaker and, like, the responsible one and always want to make decisions. And I'm happy I met Sajin because he's, like, the funny one who brings me back down to, like, go play ping pong in the basement or <laughs> play silly games, you know? <laughs> it's true, though. Yeah, you get me out of that anxious yeah. state sometimes that I get in, like, hyper fixated on, like, things that don't even ma- matter. Like, I'll get really into that leader mama bear role yeah and then just having him as like the reminder that life doesn't need to be so serious all the time yeah yeah I think that's helpful and and he says yeah he says I'm like the mini version of him now like I'll (laughs) say really funny things like she says stuff and I'm like like can't you be serious for a while (laughs) like she's like such a goofball or whatever just being like the she's basically imitating what I do like we're Putting on the Surrey Jack voice. <laughs> the Surrey Putting Jack the voice head. is my favorite. And, and like, I'm like, oh my God, be better. Be better, do better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, who, who's a better ping pong player? Oh, me we for haven't sure. played in a bit. Yeah. yeah. Tournaments. But me for me for sure, definitely. Yeah. It is him. Yeah. But so. Monopoly deal? Oh. You've been killing a Monopoly deal? Yeah. Okay, I was going to ask you, Sajin, for a sec here. I'm curious for you growing up with your mother and your two sisters being the only boy, the guy in your household, how did you figure out and define what it is to be a man? For me, it just going, going through that with, with my sisters and, and with my mom and, and where I am now, I guess like a man can be anything a man wants to be. There's, there's so many definitions of what a man is. I grew up in a way with a lot of female influences and that's impacted where I am now. Like I'm learning how to build a deck now with my neighbors and I'm learning huh. how to do the handyman stuff that I wasn't really passed down with. Right. So I'm on that journey of how to be a man. And I think for me, I'm like, when I, when I built that deck, when I did that, I had a sense of accomplishment, right? Like I felt like a man, I guess you could say. Yeah. But then I have this other side of me where I'm like, I'm not, I'm not afraid to be emotional. I'm not afraid to say goofy things yeah. or like silly things or, or cross or, your leg or watch you know, like <laughs> romantic comedy. I just like like growing up with my sisters and and having to watch Lee Lee Blonde instead of like yeah. Mission Impossible. It was just different, right? I like, yeah. had a different outlook, and I'm 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 okay with 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 crying. I'm okay with with all this kind of stuff. And I think it's yeah from my upbringing. You no, know, just like growing up once again with Cam and yeah. and with. With Rinder and Matthias and Mama, with all these people like that, that helped definitely influence me, right? Because I, I think I definitely, as a kid, I really seeked out, like I really wanted the dad, and yeah. I really wanted that that male figure in my life. So yeah. on my dad's side as well, actually, that really helped shape that kind of like masculinity side of me and, and, and what I was needing, right? Yeah. Because I was like, I was like, I yeah. And for me as a kid, without having a dad, that's that wasn't meant for me. And yeah. I was thinking that when we're talking about attachment and we're talking about what kids are miss, missing out on and what they're impacted by, I, I think I wasn't impacted by not having a dad. So yeah, having yeah. those people like kind of reaching out to me and be like, yeah, well, let's come up, come up with me and like, let's go to this party or come hang out with my friends and all those little things, I think really, really helped me out. Yeah. Did you feel when you were a little boy, like, did you feel like that was you is different for you when you would go hang out with some of your friends? Did you did you feel something different for you, or did you did it not really even occur to you? 
Yeah, I don't know. I think as a kid, maybe it, it didn't really occur to me as much as it, it occurs to me nowadays. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Like I think I think I think about it a lot more now mm-hmm. than as a kid. When I was a kid, I'd be like, I miss my dad. Yeah. And we have that that reasoning behind it or the understanding behind it, so I would, I would just feel like I miss my dad. Yeah. Or, or I kind of wanted that, but <laughs> yeah. And now it's like at, at 30 years old, it just you know, work. Yeah. How, how did you make sense of why your dad wasn't around? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I, I think we were just resilient as kids, and I think I just kind of understood and went with the flow. Yeah, <laughs> to, hey? be, to be honest with it, like, I think, I, I don't know if there was any moment there, I, I just went with the flow. I just had my dad, and I had my mom, and I, and I didn't look too much into it, really, yeah. um, at that time. Yeah. Right? I, but there was still that need, right? And there was still that underlying, I just don't think I knew how to process it. Right. Or really realize it or recognize it at yeah. that age. I'm also curious, like, being South Asian... What are some things or some gaps that you see in our culture that, you know, you hope that we can bring to the table and we can work on as a community for, for the other generation? Yeah, um, I, honestly, I think I look back at your, like your previous podcast, too. It's like it's about talking about it. It's about talking about our, our mental health, talking about the negative things and having that open communication and not being scared to being vulnerable. Yeah. Because I, th- I, I think we all go through shit. Yeah. And... And when we have that connection of being like, oh, this person has also gone through some stuff. Yeah. Right? And and then we talk about it. It feels amazing. It feels really, really good. There's a sigh of relief when you have that connection with somebody else. Yeah. So honestly, I would promote for all the all the South Asian men or whoever you are is is having that communication, talking. And I don't I, I will always promote therapy and counseling. I think that's best. But also, if you're not comfortable talking with your peers, talking with your friends, that's okay to have your emotional talk with your friends too. Yeah, I think about just talking about it and getting it out is when we'll go back to the earlier moment of the light bulb effect. Is that's when you're going to have that light bulb effect is when yeah. you're talking about it, right? When we're actually processing it. Yeah, and and we can't do that if we're not talking about it. So yeah, do you and think I, it's going to yeah. take for us to talk about it? There, there is quite a stigma, and and I think a lot of us are scared and worried on how others will perceive us, right? Because unfortunately, a lot of us do take, talk negatively and the world can be a mean place, right? So I think what we could do is, is being a bit more kind, like being a bit more empathetic, even that mean person, that Karen in the parking lot, like you, <laughs> you looking back and, yeah. and thinking about like, you know, what, what was her life? <laughs> what yeah. was her upbringing? Yeah. C- Cassie, is there anything okay. that you want to add to what Sajin was saying in terms of when he was speaking on behalf of men in the community and he talked about the South Asian men in the community and anything that you would add as a suggestion to men listening today or any of your feedback? I think Sajin said some really great points, especially about just be like talking about what's going on for you. I think that's something that can be hard and especially for boys, it can be almost like shameful to have feelings and that's not fair. Girls can talk about whatever, whenever they want, and it's fine. Yeah, like, if it's not therapy for somebody, and that's okay, uh, just finding those outlets of people who you feel comfortable talking to, and I guess that can be hard for boys sometimes, because what if you open up to somebody who's not ready to talk? Right. Like, you you get the opportunity to try and... um, have a conversation and be vulnerable, but that, that person's not ready. Yeah. I, it would really suck, but don't give up. Go try other people because it's important to feel heard. Well, it's just like therapists, right, too. Like I tell people, too, like you, like one counselor might not be the right fit for you. You might yeah. have to continue trying counseling or, or trying that until you find that therapist. Yeah, or, different methods. Exactly. Therapy. Exactly. You, you do have to keep trying. It's a journey and it's for yourself. Like, if you want it bad enough, if you, if you want to feel better, like don't give up on yourself and find whoever you need to or yeah. do whatever you need to to feel better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think that's well said. And I'm curious if you would you would say anything different for for your Indigenous community, Cass, because I know there's some overlap and similarities in what Sajin said, but I'd like to give you the opportunity to talk about your community as well. It's, it's such a tricky subject because... Well, I'm, I'm not saying they're different. I just know a little bit more about the Indigenous community and being from that community and hearing people's struggles with therapy. It's hard for 
some people in the community to open up because, you know, the person who you're talking to might not even understand where you're coming from, from a cultural perspective. And that goes through the South Asian community as well. Mm-hmm. And again, not having like the full understanding of what someone truly is going through can be difficult. Being oppressed and, you know, a lot of the people go through very similar things and it starts to become, people become desensitized or just it turns into, um, you know, this always happens, so yeah. it's okay when it's not and figuring out that journey for, for yourself too. <laughs> There's a lot of similarities to suppressing emotions and feelings and having a hard time talking about it, but that comes with trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone's on their own healing journey. Yeah, it's it it is true. And and I think for those of us that people have their own healing journey, but those of us that are I think surrounded around visible minorities, I think there's some responsibility for for listening more and as opposed to talking more and I think those that want to talk and share sometimes don't feel like they they may have the space to because people are talking for them. And I think that's sometimes a big challenge is like, how do we create more silence and space? So folks that come from communities that have a lot of generational trauma, it's it's going to be a rebuild that I'm going to imagine is going to take more than just September 30th, you know, like one day a year where we all <laughs> get a day off work and go do something. It's It's like, it's not, that's not what this is. This is h- how do we daily think about there's ways. a lot more big yeah like bigger issues that are going on right like yeah even if it, like the, the the youth that we see some of them won't access counseling because if they say something there's a children's services intervention and now they're getting removed from their home some people feel really stuck on on sharing right and that's sorry that's not just the indigenous communities yeah you can see it all around canada or all around the world but definitely i would say we see an increase yeah in these indigenous communities that that are hesitant to share is a fear of it or the fear of once again, you know, the past generation of, of what their fears are. Well, yeah. and that past isn't so far away. It's so close to today. So it's hard to not be afraid of that, I would imagine. You you both mm-hmm. work with the Indigenous community, in particular young people, right? Adolescents? Yes. I'm yeah. at the junior high and uh, he's at the I'm at the high junior. school. So yeah. you both work on a reserve at, in the school. So at a high school and a junior high. Yeah, correct. So what are some things from your own personal experience that you bring to work when you when you connect with your young people? Yeah, just in therapy, I, I really had an aha moment, like an eye-opening, not life-changing, but kind of. Like I, I realized that the person that I am today is the person who I needed when I was a kid. And like to know, to know that I'm giving students that version of me is, so rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For sure. And it's funny. I noticed I, you too, like we, we get certain groups of kids that migrate to our offices <laughs> and each counselor ends up getting like a specific, like usually it's like a group of kids that will just kind of migrate to a, a different counselor. And there's usually some kind of trend. Yeah. yeah. Like I'll get the introverts, right? Like yeah. the, the, the shy, the shy ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the ones that are a bit closed off and, yeah, and they're socially a- awkward and all that. <laughs> okay. and, and Cassie might get uh, a get different a, group I of get kids. I a lot so, of kids yeah. who like, are from single parent households, uh, specifically with no mom. And I don't disclose that to them. Yeah. But it just like ends up being the relationship that comes to my office. Right. 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 Yeah. And when you both work with young people that because you're both describing a lot of like Sajan you kind of talked that sort of it was you and maybe you still is right you're 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 the introvert mm-hmm. and for for you as well Cass so when when those young people show up where where are you at in your journey when you work with them like is that a trigger for you are you feeling like you're at a place where you're ready to give back and work with them like what's it like for both of you when you see maybe a younger version of yourself standing across the way from you I, I just see this different. Like for for me, I don't want to undermine the, the challenges that they go through there. So yeah. uh, the, a lot of the kids that I'm seeing, 
I'm missing so many different challenges yeah. and just a different environment than I grew up in. Right. So okay. they're, they're experiencing once again, different challenges that I'm going through. So for me, there's still a learning curve to yeah. it as well. Yeah. Right. Understanding and then not trying to, I'm also trying to real hard to not bring my, my past life in, into my sessions. Right. So yeah. being, being really aware of having that like individualistic approach, whoever's coming into my office. Yeah really validating their stories as well because what we see a lack lack of as well is 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 people not feeling like they're loved or they're heard right yeah. they're growing up in families right and they might have mom and dad but if mom and dad aren't healthy yeah and they're not actually caring for them and they're acting more like friends and parents yeah. there's actually we're seeing a lot of effects on that from from the youth right totally they're they're verbally saying like i need somebody that's showing me love and care yeah yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So can I just go back? I want to ask you, because Cassie, you said something really interesting. You said that it sometimes fe- seems like who you are today is the version that you could have used when you were a kid, having an adult in, in your presence when you were a kid. Have you gone back and talked to younger you? Like what would, if you have or haven't, like what would you say to little Cassie today? I have done that before. You have done that before. What can yeah. would you share with us what you would what you have said to little Cassie? I think once I came to that realization that I am not safe adult for other people. It was like a reminder to tell my younger self, I got like I got me. It's okay, like the person you needed before is you. And that helps tremendously with that working on that and figuring that out for myself like has worked tremendously on my anxiety and when I feel like self-doubt or yeah. imposter syndrome like yeah. that reminder of oh hold on you're you're a great human right you you're gonna be okay yeah I got me yeah you that's that's lovely Sajan mm-hmm. have you ever had a conversation with little Sajan Probably. I probably, went, I just went, like, went back to those moments. Yeah. Just, just looking back on it and on on where I was and what I experienced and stuff like that. Like, sometimes you have those moments, like, damn, that, that sucked for a little Sajin, right? Yeah. You feel bad for stuff like yeah. that, but then you see, once again, little Sajins all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> like, what I would want, like, it's, it's for people to know is, like, and I try to be mindful of it now with, like, all those role models in the world if you're seeing somebody struggling you don't know how much of an impact you can have on that person yeah. for showing up right like we talked about just one of my moments again talk taking me out to to movies yeah or father's day events or me making something for your husband carrie yes i like because like for me for father's day it would either be making something for my mom yeah or making for someone an impact in my life right so yeah. right there that can show him I don't know how long ago that was now. Yeah. But at that moment, I looked at Carrie and for something in Little Sajin thought Carrie's the man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like a dad like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I think if you see somebody struggling and you can make an impact, yeah. I would, I would encourage people to do that because, yeah, it can change somebody's life or it can give them some hope. Right. It can validate them and know that they're, you know, worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, at some point, the hope is that we can get to a place where we can do that for ourselves. And would would you say that you're at a place where you've been able to validate yourself in ways that maybe others weren't able to? Once again, I'll bring it back to like earlier on in the podcast. I think I'm still in this journey yeah. of of validating, of figuring myself out, doing the right things for myself yeah. to be the best version of myself, right? Yeah. So how will um, you know? I definitely... How will I know when I'm yeah. when I'm the best version? Yeah, I think it's about how you feel, right? I think I have great days, and then there's some days where I'm meditating, trying to work out, and trying so hard to feel good. Yeah. So for me, it's it's trying to get this routine, trying to get this understanding of myself. Once again, encouraging myself to go back to therapy, yeah. continuing continuing that yeah. to get myself in the in the best place that I can be. Right. Yeah. I I tell a lot of people, most of us know how to be the best versions of ourselves. That doesn't necessarily mean that we do those things. Yeah. We, we know how to do it, but we can procrastinate. We can get stuck. Yeah. We can not know how to uh, exactly do it. So yeah. 
I'm still once again in that journey of trying to figure myself out. And yeah. I, I just, I think I can do better and I can continue on this, this yeah. journey of, of healing and self identity and process some of that trauma, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I think it takes a long time sometimes. I am not one to sit here and disagree with any of that because I got a few years on you in terms of like now my 40s and I can't say that I've necessarily reached the end of that journey for myself either and I and I I think I think part of that is because hopefully we are evolving as we get older and how I saw things in relationships in my 20s versus my 30s versus my 40s and who knows when I'm in my 50s and 60s I think will probably be different. And and the question though for me is, and maybe you can ask yourself this too, is okay, you're in your 30s, I'm in my 40s, and I don't feel like I've I've come to an end of that either. I always can use therapy and do it and then find my time for me and figure out, oh shit, I gotta do this better. And and a lot of it is no matter how much we try to resolve our our childhood trauma, for me, it's like recognizing that it's always gonna come with me. And it's just a matter of what part of my trauma is where in the day. And I always look at it in driving in a car. The hope is that I'm in charge of my stuff that I can be in the driver's seat. But sometimes my stuff is driving me. And sometimes I'm all the way in the back trunk. It's so bad. And it's in the front seat. Sometimes I got my shit locked up in the trunk and I'm like, you're not getting, you know, like it's kind of, sometimes it's sitting right next to me in the passenger seat, but I still have the wheel. Sometimes it's also okay to be where we're at too. And, you know, like that's also okay. We don't always have to be projecting and moving forward. We can be in a standstill as well. And and so I, I hope for you when you're on this journey, you have moments too where you look back and you're like, shit, I ran another mile in this journey, right? Or or I'm going to take a rest on this bench for a minute. You, you no, know? That's, a, that's a great point, Karen. <clears throat> Honestly, yeah, I think so. Like you have to look at the growth and, and like take a step back. And yeah. that's what I'm doing sometimes now too. Looking at the good things that have done and just like personal growth, right? Yeah. Like just just trying to work on ourselves and yeah. and being content and happy with as with as much as that we've tried and where we've gone to. Yeah. And we can't um, always be happy. Yeah. No, we can't. You we know, can't. we can't. We like, want to be. Yeah. We want to always be yeah. happy for sure. Like right. that would be amazing. But yeah, the reality is we're not always going to be on cloud nine. We're not always going to be up there. And, no. And no. super hyped up and super happy. We're going to have those those down days right yeah and sitting in those sitting in those sad moments or like the different emotions too are what helps us grow yeah well Well, for example yeah this podcast right like this podcast has been more of a serious podcast but i still feel good from it once again we're talking about talking yeah right like working through some of those stuff and and talking about our past and for anybody it's nice to be able to have that space to talk about themselves Mm -hmm. work on themselves because a lot of times in conversations, it's usually somebody talking about themselves yeah. or, or you know, their experience. If you try to be vulnerable, they might be like, oh, I also went through that. And yeah. maybe that's not what you need, right? So yeah. part of this, you're right, these conversations is we're not saying we always have to be striving to fix things. It's just recognizing where am I at and I'm in a shitty place or good place or whatnot. And people don't have to save the world to come on and talk about their stuff. You know, we're not looking for those kinds of conversations. We're looking for everyday people that are experiencing everyday stuff. Both of you, yeah. right? You're you're mm-hmm. two of many people, unfortunately, some might say, and some might say, thank gosh, part of a single parented home. And you both started off with, well, it it's everyone has a different, anyone that grew up with a single parent is going to have a different story. Is there anything, Cass, you wanted to add to that? It's an ongoing journey for everybody. Everybody's life story, no matter what you've been through, is a life journey. A life journey, and you're always going to learn. And as you go into new phases of your life, there's going to be things that you have to work out. May I ask you both what what is one thing you wish people understood about growing up with a single parent? I guess I would say just like once again, like they they can be going through a lot of challenges for those kids. Like you want to be careful. Once again, when it's coming to poverty, like when it's coming to like food on the table, all of that stuff, like these single family homes, like Cassie said, and like maybe that's not the case. Their parents are really well off and they're doing great. But yeah. from my experience is there is a lot of challenges in the home. So just being aware of that, right? And yes. and trying your best to to show some love to those those kids and 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 doing what you 
you can to to give them some positive memories and yeah. some some good times some fun times uh, what do you have yeah, I feel like everyone should be a little bit uh, like trauma informed mm-hmm. right just have an understanding that everyone comes from different backgrounds and you know, if you're a teacher and you're working with kids, having the understanding that all of these kids are going through different things. So one kid acts out more, doesn't mean they're a bad kid, but there might be stuff going on for them behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I'll share once again, like if I think it's beneficial for the podcast, but like when I was a kid, like we went through really tough times and certain times of our life where like we would look for change. You know, you would have to heat up water for for a bath like if the the bill was cut off so right there was times for me when I was growing up as a kid there there was tough times and if if people could be like aware of that or like a bit more kind mindful exactly then 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 that would be I think super beneficial to those people that are struggling with poverty or or not having food on the table or yeah or really anything that comes with just having one one parent because let's be honest it's tough yeah. Like Cassie said too, with her dad, like raising two girls or my mom raising three of us, yeah. it's, it's extremely challenging. And I'm like, ugh, that's, that's some tough work right there. Right. Like that yeah. can't be easy for the parents as well. So I think for the whole family, it's just, and I think we, we received a lot of that. We had a lot of, I had a lot of cousins, aunts and uncles that yeah. were really super aware of what I went through. Yeah. And <clears throat> once again, showed that love and like, yeah. When I was at a hall party, people like pinching my cheeks and being like, oh, <laughs> just you, you just were like so your dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, all those things, right? Like just, just showing that love definitely helped out for me. Yeah. And, yeah. I think that's really well said, you guys. Like there's so many different people, children encounter in their day, like you said, whether it's teachers or other family members or friends. And I think just understanding that the situation isn't easy for everyone. And I have the privilege of raising my kids with my husband. And sometimes that can be a challenge for us. So when when I think of a parent raising their kid alone, I have so much respect for any parent out there that's doing it on their own because it's not it sometimes doesn't even feel possible for two parents. <laughs> and and if you're lucky, you have a village on top of that. Sometimes I think for certain visible minorities in particular, like the South Asian community, divorce, separation, or raising kids on your own can be looked like it's a bad thing that you're doing. And, and a lot of times that's your only choice. Or as a single parent, so especially if there's a divorce or separation, there's a lot of trauma in that too. And working through yeah. that process is... Is there anything at this point that you wish I had asked you today or that you really wanted to talk about? There's a point when you were talking about us being parents to our parents. Yeah. And it just brought back this story for me of, uh, it was like very close to Christmas Eve and my mom was living with us and she came up to me and she said, what did you guys get me for Christmas? And I was like, well, I'm not telling you, it's Christmas time. <laughs> and then she's like, well, you better have gotten me those boots that I wanted. And I was like, mm, they didn't get you the boots that you wanted. And then she, like, had this big meltdown about it. Wow. And, like, just thinking back, I'm like, what? A child to get mad <laughs> at your child who doesn't even have a job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That we didn't get you these boots that you wanted. Yeah. Like, now thinking back, it's pretty funny to me. <laughs> it's, like, shocking at the same yeah. time. Like, but, yeah, right? Yeah, right. I had to go through that shitty yeah. experience. <laughs> like being in a, yeah, like no wonder a lot of us have anxiety because you. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. You don't see that coming. And then all of a sudden your mom's like, why didn't you give me those shoes? And now you're in trouble. Or yeah. You didn't yeah. have the intent to hurt her feelings. That's a good point right there. It's like, no wonder we have anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> you look yeah. back at our childhood, there's, there's certain reasons that there are certain experiences and you're like oh yeah that that would probably add to it <laughs> that that's probably reasonable and it, yeah like you said yeah pa- that's that's a classic example of a pe- child parenting their parent that you would expect it the, to be the other way where your child's having the meltdown because they didn't get whatever cool thing they're hoping to get and yeah these roles that reverse i think can be difficult i do also think somewhere down the way while we're figuring our stuff out can also be helpful because it's like you get have the opportunity to look at that you have a different perspective you didn't live in a sheltered right right? like world and you i'll I'll give you a quote from jay cole 
there's beauty in this struggle because there is right like yeah. you, you learn a lot from your struggle yeah and um all those barriers that you came through all that stuff that you went through yeah it builds some strength it builds some character yeah and it makes you who you are right like totally. you wouldn't have the outlook that yeah. you do now if you didn't go through what you went through so yeah totally. there's definitely j cole man j cole beauty in the struggle yeah <laughs> so j cole man he's yeah. he's i listed him as my top five rappers when cam was on oh man i missed that top five i, I really wanted that to happen i know and yeah, well, listen to All My Life by J. Cole. That's a good one right there that just came out. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> Middle Child is also a good one. That's a great one. Yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's so many good ones, to be honest. But maybe maybe you'll have to drive out and we'll have to do an in-person one and we'll have Cam here as well. And Cam can Heck yeah. do his... Top does. five. Safety. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I love that. Right. Uh, what about for you, Sajan? Anything that you wish I had asked you today or that you wanted to share today that we didn't get a chance to talk about? All I would say is, yeah, growing up in a single family home, even though we go through different experiences, what stood up for us, us to what I hear even from Cassie is, yeah. is the positive role models, yeah. right? The aunts, the uncles, and I, and I know it sounds repetitive, but I think it's important to say for this podcast is, is that's what's gotten to us where we are now. Yeah, I, I I look back on all those those loving and those fun times. Yeah, I think as kids we just want to smile, we want to laugh, we want to yeah. have fun. Yeah, and you can if you can have more of those positive experiences and less of that stress and yeah. and leaving kids with having to carry so much stress in their lives, you know, we might see brighter future. Yeah, if yeah. you could say, but yeah, like I guess we're also desensitized and it's been tough to work too. Mm-hmm. Seeing that on the reservations of what Indigenous youth or Indigenous people face in general well, has been very eye-opening to me. What you're I saying think, about the community, yeah. that's something that's very similar in South Asian and Indigenous cultures. Yeah. Because community is so important in raising yeah, kids. Definitely, definitely. And uh, that's a lot of the struggle, finding that again for Indigenous communities because kids are taken away when really it was about families coming together to take care of kids. But back then, exactly, exactly. Yeah. They, the colonizers didn't see it that way. They saw that as being neglectful or not taking care of your kids properly. Yeah. But it is like all kids need that connection. Yeah. To help the adults and they yeah. should just be kids. Should- well, I think that's why I'm learning a lot too with like the indigenous community too is is with that culture and with that connection and with the outlook that they have. Yeah. There's a lot of healing that's going on too, right? Yeah. Which for me being South Asian coming in, in here into a different community. I'm, I'm, I'm learning so much. Yeah. And the community has been so welcoming. Mm-hmm. It's been like, honestly, a blessing for me to work. Yeah. And those kids yeah. are like my most. <laughs> yeah. These kids are the most resilient. It's like they're kids. teaching I, you I more like, than you're teaching yeah, them sometimes, you, right? Exactly. It gives you a different perspective. You hear so much strength from these kids. Yeah. And you see so much talent as well, I guess, from these communities. That's like, Honestly, it's shocking. And they're so funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. like there's, there sounds like there's a lot of hope and folks like you that are making the space and time to be there, working alongside the community members and these young people, where folks in the in the community can feel like, oh, this is what hope feels like again. And and mm-hmm. you know who who who's to say what's going to happen after that? But yeah, the way the way I hear you talk about the community, I think, and being welcomed as well, I think, what a great example to set right for for you being south asian going to an indigenous community and that's your sort of first exposure and being welcomed in that way i think is going to set a huge example because here you are today talking to us about that as well and so it sounds like it's it's rewarding at its best however probably also eye-opening in in many ways and and setting things in perspective for for you both i would imagine too yeah definitely if some Definitely. of your young people were here today, what, what would you want to share with them today? Like, what would you want to say to your the, to the community or, or the young people that you work with? I, honestly, for me, it's just thank you for teaching me. Yeah. Hey. Thank you for showing me strength in the community that they, they live in and that they're growing up in. Great to like, come into our offices and share their stories. So. Yeah. I think there's, for me, there's just a lot of learnings and there's a lot of respect. Yeah, that I have for these youth, they they come through hardship, but what we're seeing is a lot of strength, and we're seeing them still focusing on their goals. They're trying to they're trying to see the light, yeah. and and they're really they're, what I see is they're working for a better community. Yeah. It, but the cool thing too is I hear a lot of them is 
what it's going to look like in 20 years, oh, right? And yeah. you might hear some different reservations around Canada. Yeah. Is their their mindset is they want it to be better. Yeah. They're not happy with where it's at right now and they know it can be better. And once again, with their strength and with their with their goal setting and their outlook, yeah. I think they're really ready for some change. Yeah. And, and these are probably the youth that are going to do it. <laughs> oh, wow. Cool. I, I hear a lot of what you're saying too is this connection versus isolation. And yeah. so yeah. when you get to belong in a community in the way that you're talking and you're sharing and even, even how both of you are talking about your own stories. You know, when I asked you about the difference, like why aren't you the stat? I, I heard you say a lot, well, we didn't, we didn't grow up in isolation. We grew up with connection and you had family mm -hmm. members and community members and and now you're giving back as well in, in the work that you you do and that's the whole point of these conversations is can we can we help someone can we help ourselves not feel that the only alternative is living in isolation when that's that's not how humans are meant to be so kudos sure. to both of you for for honoring that so thank you for that now, yeah for sure thank you too for like having the podcast and and having these conversations because it's, it's definitely important and yeah we appreciate it too well i'm glad i'm, I'm happy I, i'll do it as long as people want me to so <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I was gonna ask you both for a call to action so what is something that you both can leave our listeners with today something they can think about or something that they can go and do a little random one off the top of my head yeah, yeah. something a lot better i'll pick cassandra off after this i'm guessing something that you guys should all do for yourself today is really focus in on on what do you love make the time for that and make sure like like weekly that you're doing that mm. for me for instance i've i've gotten into like a recreational basketball league co-ed league with my wife cassandra cassandra <laughs> I love and for me like we played for the last year i think like four seasons and for me engaging for sorry five seasons me engaging in something like basketball doing what i love i find a lot of joy i notice because once again, I'm always reflecting on where I'm at on, yeah. on my day at the end of my day. Like, how do I feel? And on basketball days, I feel amazing. Oh. So the movement, the, the, whether it's in, in a basketball court or if you're going outside for a run or a hike, yeah. I would encourage everybody for their mental health to, to continue that, like that, that physical movement, get into something that you love, that you're passionate about and just have fun because yeah. there's yeah. some beauty to that for sure. Oh, that's really well said. I love that. I love that Thanks, you both man. play basketball together. I wouldn't even know where to start. So good for you both of you to play such a oh, like, intimidating sport. Yeah. <laughs> I've been to sports and social club and it's intense out there. It's, it's a lot of fun though. <laughs> it's good. For me, yeah. I would say that um, for the listeners who are listening, like you are not what happened to you. So just to like know that about yourself and let yourself know that if Give yourself some kindness and understanding. And yeah, like what Sajan said, you need to do what you need to do to feel better. So if that's being active or me going like me going to therapy, uh, connecting with friends and family, yeah, uh, buying two dogs and <laughs> being a crazy dog mom. Yeah, that's I. That's two more than I would like in my house. So good for you. <laughs> You already have one. <laughs> yeah, well, I can hear like the most successful people, like Jason Siegel, says that he works. Like the start of his day, he works towards being happy. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, huh. Yeah. You know, even hearing from some of the most successful people in this world that they're still struggling and they're still on their journey of finding happiness. Yeah. But we can get there. Yeah. There is hope. Yeah. That we can we can get to that place. Totally. Yeah. I think that's what we probably want to leave listeners and and people with is yeah. There's hope. We can do it. There's obviously some hard work that goes into it, but with the yeah. community and, and with putting in that work, yeah. you know, we can we can have some positive changes for sure. And something else is like for the single parents listening, you guys are probably doing the best that you can and mm -hmm. your kids can see that. They might not see it right now, but they will see it down the road. Because I know it's hard to deal with kids yeah. who are going through separation and stuff like that. But they there will come a time where they they see that you're doing good and you're doing good work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Straight up. Yeah, I I think that thank you for for s leaving that for single parents out there. I think that's a really nice message and I I agree with everything you both have said. I think that's really nice feedback for folks and ha ha you know, Jason Siegel is a smart man and that piece about happiness when you were talking Saj and I thought, "Oh yeah, like 
I don't know if I'll ever know what it is to always be happy or not, because like we said, it comes and goes. But I think something that's helped me in the last little bit is understanding what it is to be, to have gratitude. And again, that bird's eye view of like kind of, and I say this to myself and stepping up (laughs) and just like, what can I be grateful for? Because there's a lot when you think of it that way, that first things first is health, if, if not everything else that follows. So a lot of, a lot of gratitude, I think, fills my cup in, in how to be happy. And so your call to action is a great one because I think resonates with a lot of people of, yeah, what, what brings me closer to that feeling of happiness and how can I help others find it too? So like, like, how can I feel good? Right? Like it maybe it's not happiness, but it's just about feeling content and feeling yeah. good. Well, thank you again, both of you. My apologies for the technology. Thank you so much. I, I think there was a lot of glitches in the vortex that you entered today. So <laughs> you did it. Thank you for spending some of your Sunday with me. And for folks that are listening, we say these conversations are door openers. So if you want to know more about this topic, please reach out. You can find us on Instagram at MFU Podcast. Or you can send us an email and we appreciate the ones that we've been getting that are coming through as well. That would be at info at mfupodcast.com. And if you have feedback for other topics, please let us know as well. Otherwise, thank you again, Sajan and Cass, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank Thank you you. so much, Karen. Thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Love you. Love you too. Love you so much.